I am Liz Marai, and I come from the Electronic Visualization Laboratory. Um, and a disclaimer first, we are neither exactly a facility or a resource of the University of Illinois. What we are is a group of faculty and students across departments. Many of us are in computer science. And mostly we are funded through research grants from NIH, NSF, um, NASA, DARPA, are gone, and with some partial support from the University of Illinois, the state of Illinois, and so on. So uh, one of the things that our lab, the Electronic Visualization Laboratory, is really famous for is as technology builders. And here are some examples of technology that came from EVL. Um, in the middle up there, you see the first virtual reality environment called a cave. That was in 1992. And that environment used projectors, so that's projected light on the walls and uh, the ceiling and the floor and so on. Uh, and people would put on glasses, kind of like you do when you go to a 3D movie and you would get this perception of, of a 3D space. And then in 2008, people at EVL started working with tactile surfaces. That was way before anybody had an iPad or a tablet and so on and so on, okay, 2008. Um, and then around 2004 and so on, people at EVL started building this amazing hardware and middleware that allows people to collaborate remotely. Uh, that middleware is called Sage2. And then in 2012, people at our lab introduced a second generation virtual reality environment called the Cave2. And this one uses uh, LED panels, 3D TVs that you can pretty much buy at Best Buy. And uh, if you took them a bit, because you know the angle you're looking at them is slightly different, you get, again, a 3D perception putting on the glasses. Um, we think it's a much, much more beautiful environment. Uh, there, it's a lot brighter than the original cave system. Um, the color stays crisp for many years, and so on and so on. Um, and the reason there's a little Death Star model in the first image Everybody here familiar with the Death Star? Yeah, <laughs> yeah all right. Uh, that's because in 1977, uh, George Lucas came to EVL and asked for a bit of help. In the original Star Wars movie, there's a pilot briefing scene where there's this blueprint of the Death Star shown on a TV screen. And they're planning how to actually destroy the Death Star. The graphics that you see on that screen in the original Star Wars were made at EVL. And I want you to know that even back then, EVL could do better graphics than that. <laughs> but George Lucas wanted them to look a bit antiquated, like they would come from a different universe, and so on. So uh, one of the things that we are really keen on is big displays. We like that a lot. And I know not everybody believes in big displays. So here's a quick demo of what you can do with a big display. Um, this is a short clip made by our colleagues at Monash University that's showing, I apologize, you're eating. It's a rat fetus and there's enough, you know, the, the size of this screen is pretty much what you would see on your regular display. If you had a huge display, something that would be the size of this wall, you'd be able to see the detail that you see right now in this image that's basically the nuclei of red cells inside this animal while seeing at the same time the entire organs and anatomy of the animal. However, today, I'm going to talk about another aspect of the work we do, we do at EVL, and that is about visual computing. And visual computing means is that area of computing that handles images and 3D models. And that includes the processes that happen at the interface between humans and data that can be represented visually. And uh, speaking of data that can be represented visually, a common outcome of visual computing are systems that can provide visual representations to humans to make them perform their tasks more effectively. And that is in recognition to the fact that while our ability as a race to generate data has grown exponentially, and you all know that, our capacity as humans to process data has remained constant. Our brains have not been rewired over the past 100 years, right? So anything that we can do to help people reason with their visual system is going to help a lot. So why the visual system? Um, I want to show you an example. Um, 
Anybody here familiar with Anscombe's Quartet? Okay, a couple of nods. All right. So this is a famous data set. Uh, it's actually a collection of four data sets. Okay. And um, it's a two-dimensional data set. You have X and Y variables. Okay. So the four data sets. And then on the bottom, what you see is a summarization of those data sets in terms of some mean and standard deviation. And if you look carefully at the bottom of this image, you're going to notice that those numbers are identical for the four data sets. All right? And even as you look at these numbers, you can probably smell that something is off here. These are not identical data sets, right? OK. Here's what's happen what happens when you actually print them. OK? These are the same four data sets. And these are things that your eyes pick up on very quickly. These data sets form different patterns. Okay? There's an outlier out there that your eyes are going to pick up very quickly. All right? So there are things in terms of pattern detection that our eyes are really good at, okay? and machines are not quite there. And this is exactly the type of problem where visual computing is incredibly helpful. Okay? Problems where we don't know the answer, problems where we don't know what we're looking for. And conversely, visual computing is not always appropriate either. If you have a question that you can answer computationally, for example, if I want to know what is the size of the largest file on my hard drive, I can write a very nice little program that's going to give me an exact number, and I don't need to create a visualization of all the files on my hard drive. In fact, the problems that are suitable for visual computing and visualization in general are those problems that feature information that is located somewhere in the head of a domain expert, okay? and where the questions that you're asking are not crisply clear. Does this make sense? Okay. Um, if the information you can translate it inside a, into a program and use it like that, and the questions that you ask are perfectly phrased, you can always, most of the times, you can write a program that would solve that question. And you don't need to use the visual system of a human as part of this loop. All right. So here's what I want to talk about today. Um, the first thing was EVL and the brief introduction to visual computing, what that is. And then I want to talk a bit about going beyond Paraview, because I know you guys learned about Paraview and visit today. Yes? Great. Uh, and then I want to tell you a few things about visual computing in precision medicine. And if we have time, I'll tell you a few things about visual computing in bioinformatics as well. And let me start with a motivated example, okay? which comes from the domain of computational fluid dynamics. All right? uh, and this was a problem that was posed in 2016. It came from the San Diego Supercomputing Center as part of the IEEE Scientific Visualization Contest. Right? And the problem uh, follows uh, like this. You have two fluids okay, of different densities. For example, you're going to take oil and pour it in water. Okay, or you're going to take uh, a saline solution and pour it in water. Okay? And as the higher density fluid disperses into the lower density fluid, there's a very interesting phenomenon happening, which is called fingering. The higher density fluid forms this kind of finger structures into the lower density fluid. All right? And this process is non-deterministic, and it leads to instability. So it's very, very closely studied by computational fluid dynamic specialists. All right. Um, can you guys kind of see the fingers forming? There's a greenish structure in the middle of that guy forming at some point, and one to the side, and so on. The really interesting about these fingers and the way they form is that there is no precise definition of what a finger is. Right? There is no mathematical formula magically that you can fit into Paraview and it's going to tell you, here's the finger. Okay? We know that fingers have higher density than the surrounding liquid, but we don't know what that density value is. It's not the highest density, okay? because in that case, the saline, top at the, the saline layer at the top of the simulation, that would be a finger, and it's not. All right. 
So because this process is non-deterministic, um, what the computational fluid dynamics specialist would do is run multiple simulations okay, with a number of different parameters. Okay? And they would try to, finger, try to figure out what is actually happening during this finger evolution. All right? um, the result of running these many, many different simulations is something called a simulation ensemble. Okay, so you have a collection of simulation runs, they use different parameters and so on. And we're not quite sure how they differ in terms of the finger evolution inside them. All right, so simulation ensembles are not quite new in computational fluid dynamics. People have been working with them for the past maybe five or 10 years, I think. And the way this process typically works is you split it in two stages, okay? First, you figure out which are your features of interest in the simulation, and you can do that in Paraview, okay? You go and tweak and so on and so on, or in Visit or in ANSYS and so on. And then once you know what your features of interest are, you create a summarization of them, okay? And that summarization is typically something very simple uh, in terms of mean and standard deviation, perhaps, all right? So two processes. First, figure out what you're looking for, and then summarize them, and then look at the summarization, all right? And you can do this as separate processes using different software. The problem with this uh, finger situation is that the fingers themselves are really hard to summarize, all right? Because we don't know how to define them, and we don't know what parameters would capture the characteristics for a summarization. So in order to tackle this problem, um, a few of my students and one of our collaborators in mechanical engineering at UIC set out to build an actual integrated interface with a computing backbone to try to figure out how to characterize these fingers and their simulations. And this is done using a technology called D3 and a number of other web technologies. Uh, it's a bit I, I would think of it as the next stage after Paraview and Visit, okay? A lot more programming than scripting. All right, so there's a lot going on into this interface, so I'm gonna slow down and walk you through it, right? Um, so we're gonna go left to right, kind of like people read, all right? And the first thing that you see on the left is one time step in a simulation, in one simulation, okay? And the things that are shown in purple are the fingers that the domain expert interactively over several weeks defined in that simulation, okay? By tweaking a number of parameters, all right? Um, there's a two-dimensional slab that cuts through that simulation, and that gives you further details about what's actually happening within a particular finger in terms of concentration, in terms of the velocity of the particles inside that finger structure, and so on. All right, um, so again, there's a computational backbone that assists in identifying these features of interest, okay? And the same computational backbone allows us to track those features over time in a particular simulation. So figuring out whether two fingers are going to merge, dissipate, and so on, what happens to them over time. So the next thing that you see is um, there's a bit of spatial context for the actual simulation. The points in gray are points of relatively high, uh, high concentration, but not quite to make it as a finger. Um, there's a layer at the top and some suggestion of the cylinder structure, right? And then in the middle of this interface, there's information about what happens to those fingers over time, right? There's a chart at the top which tells you how many fingers are in each simulation in that simulation ensemble, okay? And the one that's currently selected is shown in that light blue, all right? As opposed to the other ones which are grayed out. And then you select a small patch in that particular simulation run and look in detail at the fingers within that patch. All right, so this is kind of like the temporal context of what's happening around the snapshot in time with those fingers. And you can select a particular finger in that tree structure that goes left to right telling you what's happening over time, and that's going to load up the tree and that time step into the 3D view. 
And the last image on the right is a summarization of the individual simulation runs within the simulation ensemble. Okay? And that's a, an unusual encoding for most people. It's called the Kvyat diagram. What it does is um, it's a radial chart, okay? and each axis in that little icon encodes one particular property of the simulation. In this case, we used six different properties that, that were determined by the computational fluid dynamics expert, again, over several weeks working with the system. And some of them include the total number of fingers in a particular simulation, in, the, in that particular simulation. Um, what's the maximum concentration? How many unique fingers are in a particular simulation? And so on and so on. And then the color of that little glyph is mapped to one particular property of that simulation run. In this case, I think it's concentration. Um, and if you look at that summary, you can start picking up on similarities between different simulation runs. Uh, number three, number six, and number 14. They look fairly similar, okay? Uh, number 13 was a failed run. Nothing happened in it, okay? There was a bad configuration, nothing got produced, and so on. All right. Um, so do we have any computational fluid dynamics people in the room? Okay. Um, you guys come talk to me afterwards. I haven't met a single CFD person who didn't come up to us and say, I want this for my work. There's merit in creating a tool for computational fluid dynamics. And it's an honorable profession to be a tool builder. However, we're also theoreticians at EVL. And I want to tell you something really cute about this particular interface, okay? Anybody here familiar with the Schneiderman mantra? Anybody has heard about it? Mike, Schneiderman mantra? Okay, it's, the, it's probably the most cited paper in the visualization literature. And what it basically says as a guideline for designing such interfaces is that uh, you should start by presenting an overview to your user and then allow your user to zoom in and filter to find something interesting, and then provide details on demand. All right. And here's an example from Chipmunk, um, which basically shows a bunch of emails. Um, the first view that you see is an overview of all the servers. And then you can drill in and see a zoomed in version of a particular area. And if you select a particular node, it's going to give you the details about that particular node. And again, this is one of the most beloved things in our theory of visualization. In fact, about 10 years, this was in 1996, about 10 years later, um, there was a paper that proved, according to information theory, that this mantra is optimal. You can't do any better, all right? So it took more than 10 years until somebody actually challenged it, okay? Um, I assume nobody here is familiar with the Van Hamen Perer mantra, given that few people knew about the Schneiderman <laughs> mantra. <laughs> That's okay. Okay, so the, the, the Van Hamen Perer mantra came out in 2009, okay? And pretty much it said, you know, sometimes creating an overview of the entire information space for your user is really useless. If you're going to create a hairball of a biological network, how is that going to help your user? And instead of going with this overview first and so on mantra, they said sometimes what you really want to do is start with a search operation and then show the context around the locations of interest and then expand on demand. And this mantra is kind of similar to the way Google Maps works. All right, so you first look for a particular neighborhood, you find it, you explore a bit around it, and then you might move somewhere else, depending on your interest, all right? And note that it's been about 10 years since the second mantra came out, and it's only now starting to gain some traction within the visualization field. All right, now let's look again at the interface that we built, okay? Arguably, the overview of this information space is down there. That's your collection of simulations, the summarization of all the information for your problem, right? Um, 
The area here corresponds to the details. Features of interest in computational fluid dynamics are equivalent to details in visualization, right? And the middle thing is showing the local context, okay? I wanna assure you that the way we arrived at this particular interface is not by chance. <coughs> The way we built this interface was for many, many cycles of working with a domain expert and tweaking. One of the most interesting things we did was, because we're tech builders, right, and we have access to technology, we built interfaces that swapped these different views, okay? This one in particular starts with some sort of overview, a scatter plot of the multiple variables in the simulation, and then the spatial context, and then the details within the simulation. And what we found out was whenever we swapped where the details were going, that's where our domain expert was going to, okay? He gravitated towards the details view like a bee gravitates towards honey. Does this make sense? All right, good. So we did the right thing, and we actually looked at our domain expert's workflow in dealing with this interface. And we looked at scientific workflow theory, okay? which says that you can take the workflow of anybody and split it in three different components. You can look at the data flow within that workflow. You can look at the control flow, which steps need to be executed. And then which resources are used at what part of the workflow, all right? And in addition to that, I've added in the first column the equivalent to detail, overview, and context, all right? And if you look at this, analysis that you created was, you start with a, an, an ensemble, which is a collection of simulation runs, all right? And then for each simulation in your ensemble, you're going to run the simulation given a collection of points, okay? You're going to somehow calculate the finger structures within that simulation, analyze them, track them over time, analyze the collection of fingers, summarize the collection of fingers, and then analyze the simulation as a function of fingers, and finally summarize the ensemble as a function of those simulations of fingers. So your ensemble is a function of the simulation, and the simulation is a function of fingers, all right? So the fingers, which are highlighted in green, are really at the core of this entire endeavor. Does this make sense? It makes perfect sense that our domain expert wants to spend as much time as possible with the fingers. That is their core activity. They want to be able to define the fingers and figure out what their characteristics are and so on and so on. All right. So what this led to was a third theoretical guideline. You have the Schneiderman mantra, start with overview first. You have the Van Hamen Perer mantra, start with search first. And here's a mantra which goes like details first, show context, and then summarization overview last. And we know this mantra is correct because when our co-author sat down and observed then other computational fluid experts in their workflow, all of them started with the details, okay? The best way they put it was the features of interest are hard to define, but when you see them, you'll figure them out immediately, all right. Uh, it turns out that this details first paradigm does not exist only in computational fluid dynamics. It's extremely common in computational fluid dynamics, okay? People are interested in particular areas where the vortices show up, for example, okay? Uh, where a shock is located and so on. But they also happen in biology where people are interested in the bonding sites of a particular protein, okay? And they also show up in journalism. It turns out that people are really interested in seeing details first. All right. Um, I think the most interesting lesson from this little dive into the theoretical background of a visualization interface is that this is not a general critique of the Schneiderman mantra, okay? What this is a critique of is of its inappropriate application in practice without paying attention to the data flow into a particular problem, to the user workflows, and to the user knowledge. All right. And if anybody here is interested what's in what's actually going on between 
during the conversation between a visualization expert and a domain expert, there's a paper that I very warmly recommend that talks about the different aspects that need to be captured in that analysis of a workflow. All right, which brings me to my next topic, visual computing in precision medicine. And this is work that we also do at the Electronic Visualization Lab. Um, how many people here are familiar with precision medicine? Okay. There, there are multiple possible definitions. The one that I like best says that in the future, when a new patient is going to walk into a doctor's office, the doctor is going to collect a bunch of data from that patient. Um, and then they're going to go in the cloud and find a cohort of patients that are similar to that new patient. And they're going to look at all the treatments that have been applied for that particular disease to that cohort of similar patients and figure out which one worked best. And they're going to choose that treatment and have the new patient follow it. Um, as you can imagine, precision medicine means a lot of data, right? <coughs> From many people, huge databases, and so on. And that is not particularly new in computing, right? People have been working with large data sets, uh, for example, in astronomy, for a long time. What makes this particular type of problem interesting is that not only is the data really, really high dimensional, it's also heterogeneous. It comes from a multitude of different sources. Um, it's also locally sparse and dense. What does it mean locally sparse? Not all patients are going to have all the labs done, right? Some people are going to have their CT scans, some people are not going to have them. Um, and then this data changes dynamically over time. Um, in addition, and that's the part that makes it interesting to me personally, is the situation where there's spatial information within the patient data, okay? For example, your tumor is located to the left of your spine or very close to your left eye. Where does that information go in data science? Data science statisticians are really great at taking vectors of numbers and doing calculations over them. When it comes to spatial information, uh, lungs, brain, and so on and so on, they're not so good at figuring out how similar people are based on that information. Um, and this is work that we did as part of a multidisciplinary team, uh, kick-started by a collaboration between NIH and NSF. Um, here's an example of what we did in terms of visual computing. One of the things that happen in head and neck cancer is that not only you have the main tumor in head and neck, um, the disease also travels along lymph nodes in the head and neck. Uh, they kind of form these kind of chains and it travels down on them. And therapy needs to target those nodes specifically. And the question here was, the doctors wanted to know whether we could help them find patients that had a similar pattern of lymph node spread of the disease, all right? And it turns out that you can actually do this. You can define a topological map over their head and neck. Uh, you can build this kind of graph representation of which areas are adjacent to each other and so on, and then do some sort of subgraph similarity between different patients and build a similarity metric. Um, here's an example from a data set of 250 people. The first patient, that's an abstraction of the graph structure I had earlier on. There's nobody in that 250 patient data set that is identical to that first patient, okay? Um, what the colors mean is, Light purple is left, light green is right, and where you see the dark blue, that's somebody who has um, lymphs affected on both the left and the right side of the head. And this algorithm doesn't care, uh, is, can handle symmetry, so it will find all the patients that have exactly the same pattern on the left side to somebody who has that pattern on the right side. Okay, so you can kind of see that this metric finds patients similar, as close as possible to the first person within the data set. And how the doctor actually used this result is once you have this measure of similarity based on spatial information, you can start clustering people, okay? And then you can start looking at the side effects, what kind of toxicity they get from treatment. And then you can see that people in a particular cluster respond differently to treatment and so on. All right. Okay. 
Um, there's another question here, which is about how do you communicate these results to a doctor? And that's a different paper that uh, came out this year, TVCG. Um, the little representations down here, you might recognize them from the computational fluid dynamics interface. They also show you how similar patients are across the data set. Those are the five more similar patients to the per patient selected. Um, you can do the same thing in 3D, and that's a different project. Uh, this time a three-dimensional topological map. All right. Um, how much time? 10 minutes? All right, good. So the last topic I wanna briefly talk about is visual computing in bioinformatics. All right, so, so far we talked about uh, going beyond ParaView in computational fluid dynamics with a bit of theory behind it. And then we talked about visual computing and medicine using, using images and 3D models. And the last thing is going to be about visual computing and bioinformatics. Um, and in particular, I wanna tell you a few words about a piece of scientific software that I co-authored, which is being adopted at over 40 different institutions. Um, and basically, the problem that the system tackles is um, related to cell signaling. Anybody here doing work in cell signaling? All right. Um, okay. Let's say that you get startled, okay? Something really scary happens to you. Um, your heart rate is gonna go up, right? You're gonna break a sweat, okay? Um, the little hairs on your arm are going to stand up, okay? And the way this sequence of events happens is through signals traveling within your body, right? Um, what is shown in this image is one illustration of what happens during this fear response into a single cell, okay? And as you can tell, this is a really, really complicated problem. All right? Okay. One of the things that people in computational biology do is um, instead of working only in the wet lab with specimens and samples and so on, they started using computers to simulate these signals. And the way they handle this is they kind of think of it as an electric circuit, okay? So here's your cell and you have some input, electrical input applied to it and then that signal travels within that electric circuitry and it produces some output. And if you have um, an electric circuit, you can also write the partial differential equations that describe the electricity flowing through that circuit and you can simulate those partial differential equations and compute the outcome. All right, so if you take a biological model and translate it into this kind of electric circuitry model, you can actually predict what's going to happen at the output depending on what you applied at the input. Okay, anybody here dares to guess how, how fond biologists are about writing partial differential equations? <laughs> Not at all, okay. So uh, people at Los Alamos came up with this really, really smart language, okay? And the language basically allows you to write a set of rules, okay? For example, I have compound A and compound B, and at these concentrations, within time, this much time, they're going to result in some other compound, okay? And you write a bunch of such rules, and this language automatically takes that set of rules and compiles them into executable code. Okay, so it translates them to the partial differential equations and then produces some output. And the way you would do this is you'd go look at the literature, find a biological model that has been described as part of a wet lab experiment, and then you'd go and write in your little rules about how you think things are going to interact within that system. You're going to run the simulation with the system called BioNetGen, um, and then you're going to check whether the out output matches what was reported in the literature. If it matches, you're good. If it doesn't match, you're gonna go back and tweak your model and rerun it and over and over and over again. Now, it's really easy to keep track of maybe 10 rules at a time. Even the simplest model that biologists work with have thousands of rules to tens of thousands of rules. And it's really easy to make a mistake as you write those rules, all right? 
So what we did in this case, we built a system that spanned everything from building the model to the simulation and to the analysis, and that's Rule Bender. Basically, that's where you write your code, and those are so compact visual representations of what's actually going on with your model, okay? Not with the actual biological structure underneath and the sequence in which these rules are firing. And then you run the simulation and you get the output and so on. Um, there's something really interesting about how those visual representations are built. They're really compact. This is a representation for an example that has six molecules and 37 interactions. Each of the bubbles in that illustration corresponds to one molecule. And if you count with me, you're going to notice that there are five bubbles, not six, in that illustration, okay? And the reason there are five bubbles and not six is because this representation shows exactly once each molecule within your model, regardless of how many instances of it show up in that biological model. Does this make sense? So that model might have six molecules, but one of them is a duplicate, all right? And this model captures the rule-based model that you're building to describe the electric circuitry, not the biological model with the two duplicate molecules in it. Um, and you can look at things such as what are the requirements for a rule for particular to fire and so on. Um, this is an example of how this illustration is helpful to a computational biologist. In this case, what you can see from this illustration is that GRB2 gets bound to EGFR. EGFR is a molecule important in cancer modeling. Um, there are two possible pathways, the lower one and the higher one, okay? There's also a very tiny precondition. The upper pathway can only happen where the R subdomain is bound to itself. Here's another thing that's going to be close to your hearts if you're doing simulations. Uh, this is a very simple exercise that um, computational biology students are asked to do in their first year of graduate school as they learn this Bionet gen language. Um, it's something about the allergen reaction in the human body. They write a little set of rules and invariably they forget one tiny little rule. And when they run their system, they end up with an infinite chain that never completes, okay? And it's one of the most frustrating exercises for anybody, right? With this system, they actually can see that the correct structure looks like the one on the right and they forgot to say that that little U compound needs to be unbound, not bound to anything, okay? If they forget to specify that, then the U keeps binding over and over and over, forming an infinite chain. All right, here's another cute example, this time from comparative genomics, and this time using one of those big displays. This one is showing about 700 E. coli genomes, and this is work done by Julian Orisano, who's a graduate student at, at EVL. Um, one of the interesting things here is the alignment code that aligns these genomes depending on the common subsequence in them and so on. I told you a few things about visual computing, okay? And I think the most interesting thing about the visual computing is that it covers a lot of territory from practical applications to dealing with the theory of visualization and design and then to creating new algorithms and then novel encodings, visual encodings. In terms of applications in engineering, visual computing can facilitate the analysis of really complex phenomena. For example, that fingering simulation. In precision medicine, visual computing can enable novel calculations over images and 3D models. That is cutting edge research, okay? Nobody is able to do calculations over spatial information in medicine, aside from this select projects. Um, in bioinformatics, visual computing can enable you to bridge wet lab experiments with in silico experimentation. And in general, aside from everything that I talked about today, visual computing can also help you share cognitive spaces. And I'm going to show a very quick demo of Sage 2 during the question session. And can facilitate the communication of results. Um, acknowledgements are due to the federal agencies that have supported this work and to our collaboration collaborators and students, including those at the Electronic Visualization Lab. 
And thank you, and I will gladly take questions. And what I'm going to show in the background there is a demonstration of a middleware called, called Sage2, developed at EVL, that allows anybody to share the content of their screen on a tile display. You'll notice there are no cables between the laptops and the tile display, all right? And you're going to see demonstrations of people doing uh, video conferencing, remote, connections, playing movies, sharing images, and so on and so on. So thank you. <laughs>